thank you. Um, in what can I only consider a sick joke, I've been given the unenviable task of the penultimate talk before the keynote. And unfortunately for the rest of you, this is going to be a talk on testing. <laughs> and specifically, this is going to be a talk on testing functional user interfaces. So that's apps and UIs written in functional programming languages or using functional patterns. So maybe a bit about me before we get into that, my credentials. Uh, I'm a front-end web developer, as Jack said. Um, I've got over seven years of experience doing Elm development at this point, maybe just over five doing that professionally. And I'm also the author of my own front-end framework called Luster, which is written in and for Gleam. Of course, my main credentials are I have two cats named after programming languages, uh, Haskell and Ada. But if I'm going to talk about testing today, then I first have a confession to make. And that is, I hate writing tests. And specifically, I hate writing UI tests. And I think the reasons for that are probably something that everyone in this room can resonate with. So I'm going to tell a story, a scenario that's played out multiple times in my career. Uh, and maybe you can tell me if this sounds familiar. So you're starting a new project or a product and you and a small team of engineers quickly spin up an MVP that you get to a small group of users or maybe internally in your team for testing. And inevitably, something goes wrong. Someone hits a catastrophic bug, and everything is on fire. So as a team, you get together to work out how can we make sure this doesn't happen again. And maybe you or a coworker or your boss they suggest end-to-end -end testing for your core user journeys. So this way, you can make sure that things like you know, login, they never break. And so you spin up some testing infrastructure. You pull in something like Cypress or some sort of browser. And you write your first browser automation test. So go to this page, fill out this form, click this button, and then take a snapshot. Now, this is a screenshot of the current page. And the way these testing tools work is they will tell you when that screenshot changes. And you're feeling pretty good about this. You fast forward 12 months. You've shipped a bunch of features. You've been writing and adding new tests as you go along. And then your CI takes 20 minutes to run. And then it fails because you tweaked some styles and you forgot to change those snapshots. So you update them. You push. You wait another 20 minutes. Everything goes green, and then you get yet another bug report because everything is on fire again, and your tests didn't really catch anything that you cared about. Now, your response is probably one of two things. If you're like me, you immediately write off testing for the next five years, or you attend a talk like this, and you ask, can we do better? And I think if we're going to do better than that, then we need to know what it is that we're actually testing for. If those tests failed, then we never got the answers that we were looking for. We need to be catching bugs, not discovering them. And for that, I think UI testing comes under four categories. The first is business logic. So this is sort of any kind of computation that's not tied to rendering, decoders, derived data, anything like that. The next is presentation logic. So the kind of the opposite, the code that works out what to show and when organizing state transitions. We have our content, you know, the text that we're displaying, the prose. And of course, we have the design. What does it look like? Does it match our branding? Is it using our design system? Now, I'm going to make the case that functional UIs, functional programming, is particularly good when we approach testing from this lens. But to do that, I think we should understand what it is that we're up against. So this is a React component, or the scaffold for a React component, uh, a login page or a login form. And you can kind of think about it broken up into three kind of sections or bits. So the first is state. We set the state for our form. We have you know, our email and our password fields, a flag for whether we're loading or not. And of course, maybe there are some errors that we want to show on the screen. Then we have behavior. So we have this handle click function that modifies some state, that launches a side effect you know, to do our login, and then it handles the response. 
And then, of course, we have our render logic. You know, return some JSX, do some conditional rendering. In these event handlers, it's not uncommon to affect state changes directly there in the handler. So in this input hand on change handler, I would probably just immediately call, you know, set email with the new value. So I would ask, how do we test this? All of those pieces, they're encapsulated in that login component, and that login component didn't take any arguments, so how are we gonna affect any change in order to test it? Well, the usual response is that we test it like a user would, and we pull in some sort of browser uh, mocking library, like JS DOM, happy DOM, something like this, and we default to interacting with that component like a user would, so we write the same sort of tests as we did with our end-to-end -end tests where we interact with the DOM, we click buttons, we type in inputs. But functional UIs are different. I would wager that most functional UIs, most functional apps, they start looking like this. So again, we have some state. Uh, if we're doing typed functional programming, then we define our model type. This encapsulates the state of our program or our component. And if we're also doing typed functional programming, then we're already being pushed into modeling things in this kind of nice domain-specific way. So we have this some type submission status, which replaces that like Boolean flag and that nullable error into one nice thing that we can pattern match on. And then we have our behavior. So with this, we, we use a message type. So this models all of the ways that the outside world can talk to our program. So we can say that the user changed their email or their password, they clicked the submit button, and then we get a response from the API. And we handle that in an update function, usually by pattern matching on that message. The, the important thing that I want to draw attention to here is that the side effects of our updates, these are handled separately. So we return a new model and we also say these are the effects that we want to run, we want to happen. And of course, finally, we have our render logic. So we define a view function, it takes our current state and it returns some HTML, an element. And here, we don't do state updates directly in render, instead, we return a message, and we know that that will be handled by our update function. And of course, we can do conditional rendering and view logic here. So again, I ask, how are we different? I kind of described those two approaches in very, very similar terms, right? We have state, we have behavior, we have render logic. So what makes these things different? Well, for these functional UIs, these pieces are separated by design. We don't have encapsulated components. We have completely separate update function, view function, and these are tied together with a runtime. And this, this produces a unidirectional update loop. This architecture is commonly known as the model view update architecture, and it was first kind of introduced or popularized by Alm but these days, you can find this approach in like many, many languages, including non-functional languages. So there are, um, there's Rust libraries that take this approach. There's React state management that takes this approach. And so what we can take away from that is that everything that we're gonna talk about today is applicable to many, many different languages. As long as they're using these functional patterns, then these ideas will apply. And that separation, that is our superpower when it comes to testing. So if we look at those four categories of test, what I want to do is go through each of them and talk about the different ways that we can write tests to target just these categories. The obvious first one is business logic. We're doing functional programming. Let's write some unit tests for our functions. It's, we're already being pushed to write small composable functions that operate purely on data, and so these are probably quite easy to unit test. But maybe a bit more interestingly, we can also unit test our update function. We have this message type that describes all of the ways the world can speak to us, and that means that we can pose interesting questions, like what happens if a user clicks submit with an empty form, and we can write tests expecting a certain response. So here, we initialize our model in some sort of pending state, 
and we say, okay, the user clicked submit. I've got a new model, and I'm gonna assert that it looks like this with some sort of failure. We also have presentation logic. This is probably gonna be the bulk of your testing. Now, we've moved on from the dark ages of imperative programming, direct DOM manipulation. We're doing declarative programming now. And that means our views, they're just functions and data. And when we have data, we can write tests for it. And so we can do something as simple as asserting a particular view function returns a particular fragment of HTML. And this is functional, but it leaves a lot on the table, right? We have to know ahead of time that that button emits a particular message. And if we get this wrong, our assertion will be wrong and our test will fail for reasons that we don't really care about. Here we're testing if the loading status of a button renders that spinner, right? We don't really care about the event handler here. But if user just data, then they can probably just be queried. Uh, and so I would expect to find a query API or a query library in most of these languages. Elm has one, Lustre has one. And for this, we can now write much more holistic tests. So we can initialize an entire model and call our view function and say, I expect somewhere in the rendered HTML this loader circle will exist. Of course, presentation logic isn't just given this state, I expect this. It's also about orchestrating state changes over time. And for that, we can exploit the fact that functions compose. And specifically, we can compose our update and our view functions. So here, I'm saying initialize in some pending state, click the submit button, and then call view. And again, I expect this to now be in a loading state. But why stop at one message? If we sequence multiple messages as part of our test, then we have a really good way of simulating user journeys using that domain language that we built up as our message type. So in this test, I sequence three messages. I am simulating the user typing in an email address and pressing submit and getting an error response from our API. And to run that test, we just need to fold over that list of messages, calling update over and over again, and then asserting something about the result. The third category of test is content. At this point, it's kind of unavoidable. We're gonna to need to read something. This is talking about the text content of our apps and our sites. Now, earlier I spoke about visual snapshot testing, taking screenshots of a browser. Well, we can apply this testing approach to text as well. Here, I am rendering some HTML. I'm pulling out a bit that I'm interested in, and I'm using a library called Birdie to take a snapshot of it. And what we get back is a file that looks something like this, which we have to review for the test to pass. We have to read it, we have to accept it. And then, if that changes in the future, a snapshot testing library is gonna tell us that it changed and show us where. And that gives us an opportunity to review that change. Maybe it was a typo and we can fix it. Or maybe that change was intentional and we wanna carry that change forward for future test runs. The fourth category of testing is design. And at this point, we're gonna to need to pull in a browser. We can't get away from it at this point. But we don't need to reach for slow CI, slow end-to-end -end testing, because we can look at applications like Storybook, or perhaps a framework-specific one, like Elm Book or Fable. And what these do is that they render components isolated from the rest of your app. Now, this has the benefit of encouraging good encapsulated design, but for traditional frameworks like React, this comes at a bit of a problem. Our login form, it didn't take any parameters. It required user interaction. And so we could show the form, and we could guess that it would be functional in, a, in an environment like this. But we couldn't present that form in any particular state. Again, that separation is our superpower. 
because all of the state of our view functions is externalized. So we can very easily say, well, I want to show my login form in an error state, in a loading state, what it looks like when it's only partially filled in. So good tests know what is being tested. But a good test strategy knows what to test in the first place. And once you understand that there are four different kind of categories of tests, things that we can be testing for, you can use that knowledge to shape what it is that you're actually going to test. Maybe you're only building an internal tool. Well, then you probably only need to write business logic tests. Perhaps this sprint, you're really focusing on product, your customer experience. Well, for that, you can focus your tests on presentation logic from content. And another example, maybe you're building a design system. There's no business logic here. We're just going to write our tests focused on presentation logic and design. We're going to lean into Storybook. So to recap, there's still a place for end-to-end -end testing. And that is testing your core user journeys with your real backend, with a real browser. But functional UIs, they empower our testing strategy. They let us write focus tests for the things that we care about. Thank you for listening. Okay, so I think we have time for just yeah. a couple of questions. So there's a mic here, I can bring you the mic. Um, with your example of the snapshot testing when you were using Brody, do you ever find in production that those get like really, 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 really long and the diffs are hard to read? Do you have a technique yeah. for avoiding that? Yeah, so I think my tip for avoiding that is to like focus your tests more. I mean, so like you could take a snapshot of an entire page and you might feel good about that the first time you do it and then, you know, something changes and now, yeah, you've got like a... Yeah, so my, my suggestion would be to snapshot only the actual parts that you'd care about. And very unlikely, it's very unlikely that you want to test what an entire page looks like. Not in one test. You might you've spread that out over multiple tests. Brilliant. So, again, one big round of applause for Haley.